everyone, this is the next episode of Somarpod with Nick Thorpe, a journalist and documentary filmmaker, the Central European correspondent of BBC News. Nick lives in Budapest since uh, 1983. And, uh, 86, really. 86, okay, thank you. And speaks fluent Hungarian. But today on my request, we will have this interview on English. Oh, let me switch to Hungarian for a bit. Üdvözlök mindenkit, ez itt a Szamárpad. Mai vendég Nick Thorpe, uh, újságíró, dokumentumfilmes, a BBC News közép-európai tudósítója. Nick kiválóan beszél magyarul, de az én kérésemre angolul fogunk beszélgetni. Viszont angol és magyar nyelvű feliratot készítünk ehhez az adáshoz, amit a lejátszón az alul levő CC feliratú gombbal lehet majd kibekapcsolni. So, Nick, you joined to the BBC in 1986 as a Budapest correspondence first, and it was the first uh, Western correspondent to be based here. And you continue to report on Eastern Europe ever since. You are responsible for covering Hungary, Bulgaria, Romania, and other countries in the region, including the Balkans. You were covered the fall of communism, the collapse of Yugoslavia, and the EU membership process of many countries in the region. In April 2016, you were the co-recipient of the Peabody Awards in public service category for your contribution to the European migrant crisis, a new life in Europe, the year of migration, with BBC colleagues at BBC News, BBC World Service, and BBC Radio. How did you choose Hungary in the first place? Um, you were settled down before the BBC job, or you arrived uh, to uh, for this position in 1986? Well, you you were partly right, Kaudoy, when you said 83. I'd actually visited Hungary the first time in 1983. I made some good friends here, and when I had the idea of uh, becoming a journalist. Um, mm -hmm. I thought I'd start in Hungary. So I didn't really arrive here. No one sent me here. I came as a freelance journalist then. Um, uh -huh. Obviously, it was communist Hungary at that time. And um, the authorities didn't really understand the idea of a freelance journalist. So uh -huh. also, you know, I had very little journalistic experience. You know, I would just simply went around different media that I liked in Britain before I left saying, look, I'm moving to Hungary. I'm not asking you to give me any money, I'm not asking you to give me any uh, papers to say I represent mm -hmm. you. I'm just coming to Hungary. It's a country I like. I find it a very interesting time in history. And, um, and I said I was a journalist. This was, uh, I think it was stretching the truth a little bit. I wanted to become a journalist rather than mm -hmm. that I was a journalist at that point. And um, so that's why Hungary. Um, and, you know, already, I, don't, I wouldn't have come here if I hadn't fallen in love with the place a bit in 1983 when I first came. I was coming as far as I could see to the east. I didn't think I'd stay very long. I thought I would go further east, possibly to Central Asia or... Southeast mm -hmm. Asia, um, but this was East enough for that time in my life. I was, I liked, I was attracted by the East. Um, Elmer Honkish around that time, a Hungarian yeah. sociologist wrote about how when you cross the border from Austria into Hungary in the 1980s, one immediately, everything was sort of dustier and didn't work so well um, that, um, people seemed to be suffering more. People were struggling harder to make a living. Um, and coming from an affluent Western Europe, there was something attractive to me. I found it more rockensendesh, more closer to my heart somehow, a country mm -hmm. that was um, less smoothly functioning, um, less uh, talk about fun and more talk about how to survive the determination of the Hungarians, the stamina of the Hungarians always um, I, I always attracted me. And somehow I stayed six months, six months turned into a year and one year turned into 35 years. So it's been okay. a long journey. Yeah. 35 years now, great. I saw a short film from uh, 1988, it's called Young Hungarians, where you describe Hungary as a 
country in transition from socialism to an early stage of plural democracy, showing the contrast between rural and city life, the past with bullet holes on the house walls from 1945 and 1956, and the present pop culture of the young generation. You showed how the country opening to it, its economy, to Western brands, uh, they were opening first franchises here like Adidas, McDonald's in Budapest, but still we've been an occupied country at that time and we have, have around like 50,000 Soviet soldiers deployed in the country. Did you face any restrictions at your work when where you've been uh, uh, at your work? Were you being followed or watched by Hungarian or other sec secret services, you think? Did they tap to your phone and reading your letters or you were, uh, you, you exercised a, a freedom of, uh, in your work here? What was your uh, impression? No, I knew I was followed, not all the time. I don't think I was the most interesting person uh, here for them, but as a reporter, as a freelance reporter, um, mm -hmm. I think they didn't quite understand who I was. There was a, at that time, there was a Scottish uh, journalist, Charlie Coots, uh, mm -hmm. a member of the British Communist Party who'd been here since, I think, 1957. And um, he was working at the English language section of Hungarian radio. And uh, he was one of the first people I came and had lunch with and had mm -hmm. a chat with when I was first here. And I told him what I was doing, you know, a, a young 25, 26 year old journalist coming to be a freelance reporter. Soon after that, as he told me very humorously, he was called into the party to, and they asked him, you know, who is this Thorpe? What does he really want? Who's he really working for? Because from the beginning, the authorities here didn't believe that I was a journalist. Uh -huh. um, they, they assumed that I had some subversive intention. And therefore, you know, in 1991, when the uh, archives were partially reopened, I did ask for my files. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, you, you have the sort of pencil markings down the side of your files when you get them. And, it, mm -hmm. and, and there's a kind of key at the bottom and it tells you how they got that information, whether it was a, someone following you, whether it was a, an insider, someone pretending to be your friend, um, or whether it was a telephone tap or some other form of information. So it was, it was actually as if someone else had been keeping my diary for me which so I was quite grateful because I'd forgotten all all kinds of people I'd met at that time and all kinds of things <laughs> I'd done one of my favorite entries was um of a you know I walked to uh, Estegon once with the Dunakur around about 1986 so it was an environmental protest against the yeah. um mm -hmm. the bush um power plant uh, mm -hmm. power plant and the Nojmarosh power plant and um one of one or two, in fact, it turned out later, I even know their names today, of the people within the Dunakur who were working for the secret services. Um, their comment on that day was, the so-called journalist makes no secret of his sympathy for the environmentalists. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> um, which is, um, I'm glad they noticed my enthusiasm for, you know, um, for nature really which i keep yeah. to this day i would um perhaps i'm a so-called journalist today still but i'm still sympathetic to the idea of saving the planet and i think anyone who isn't sympathetic to maintaining you know a sustainable uh planet or ending or slowing down climate change is uh, needs their head seen to mm -hmm. okay so in hungary we had this phrase uh that the happiest bar barack in the Soviet bloc. Uh, they used to call us like goulash uh, communism, referring to a relatively higher living standard when you can put food on the table every day and you can even own a car. So we had that legend that we Hungarians are somewhat special as we can trick even the big brother Soviets, you know, by doing the communism on our own way. So when the Soviets pulled out uh, and Hungary announced as a republic, we had really high hopes that maybe in 10 years uh, with hard work and enthusiasm, 
or economic and catch up to Austria and soon the rest of the Western countries. Do you remember those years? Did you share this optimism uh, at, uh, at that time or you were more skeptical about it? Well, how do you feel? How do you remember those era? Um, in many different ways, really. It's not easy to give a simple answer to that mm -hmm. and, or even mm -hmm. a, a straightforward answer because my all the answers I could give to that would be ambiguous or contradictory. Um, to begin with, I think um, the late 1980s and early 1990s here, I felt there was a great um, blossoming. It was a, a spring. It was the Budapest spring. It was the Hungarian spring at that time because people were, were very hopeful. They mm -hmm. They had kind of achieved something. Of course, it wasn't a revolution in a classical sense in which you execute the dictator as happened in Romania, for example. It wasn't a classical revolution as in Prague, which I also witnessed where you, um, where the, the demonstrators gather in the street, are beaten by the police, and then the crowd gathers and gathers and, until the sort of tide of public pressure forces the government to step down. I think, you know, in staying with the late 1980s for a while, I was always struck here by um, the intelligence of the reform wing, uh, the common sense of the reform wing of the Communist Party, and also the internal opposition. Obviously, there were the heroic democratic opposition figures who were witnesses of an open society and acted as if the society was open in the hope that the day would come. But I think a lot of people that did the heavy lifting work to change the political system here were working on the inside. I always had a soft spot for Imre Pozhkoy, for example, who I think mm -hmm. did a great deal to persuade the Communist Party not to fight back, to let the changes happen, to engineer that from the inside. I had a lot of time for Rezhen uh, within again, within the Central Committee of the party, but especially for journalists within newspapers um, like Heti Vila Gostashag, um, like Eletes Irodolom, uh, mm -hmm. and within Hungarian radio at that time as well. People who were really um, starting to act in a cautious but brave way to spread genuine information and not tow the party propaganda line. And so I think Hungary did, moving on now to 1990, I think Hungary did have a, a great start on the other countries emerging from communism, because there was a, already a, um, a thinking, working, intelligent uh, population and people uh, working already with a concept of what a, a more liberal society might be and what a democratic, how a democratic society might work. And so it was a very optimistic, a very happy time, as I remember the 1990s. Um, but of course, the stakes were very high. Um, I quoted Elmer Honkish before. I'd quote him again here that in a way he wrote sometime that the stakes were too high. Somehow from one day to the next, it was going to be decided who would have power and who would be powerless, who would mm -hmm. have money through the privatization or reprivatization yep. process, who would be left out of that. And people panicked in Honkish's words and they turned against each other. And I mm -hmm. felt there was a, a kind of a false hostility growing at that time out of in the early 1990s, where people felt that to make politics, you had to hate the other side. Um, uh, and that that has lasted to this day. I think the roots of the current polarization um, started, uh, started yeah. then. And so it was it was a it was a wonderful time to be a reporter here. But it was also um, one could feel the sort of dark clouds gathering and those clouds, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, it's still raining. Yeah, that's true. So as a Central European correspondent, as you, you were covering Romania, Yugoslavia, where the transition wasn't this smooth as in Hungary from between the political systems. And uh, I think Hungary uh, in the, during the 90s, has a very high reputation, mostly for its role played in the German reunification. 
And the speed, maybe we were doing the economic transition and consolidation comparing to other countries. Uh, can you confirm this? And uh, do you think we got, uh, uh, we managed to profit from this advantage uh, at that time? Uh, also, as all the statistics shows that these benefits are gone by today. Uh, uh, can you confirm it? How do you feel? I think, you know, it, it, I felt as a Westerner with a great sympathy for Hungary at that time, and not just for Hungary. I'd already spent quite a lot of time in Transylvania, in Romania, even during the Ceausescu time, I used to travel there with Hungarian friends taking food to Hungarian villages then, and I'd actually been uh, banned from Romania during the Ceausescu time in 1987. I was banned from 87 to 89. I couldn't enter and only mm -hmm. went back in during, during to cover the revolution. But um, in terms of the position Hungary was in and whether and how Hungary was seen in the West, I think there was a sympathy and an openness and an interest, not just from Germany, obviously, which felt grateful in Hungary's role, but also from my own country, from Britain, from France, from Italy, from Spain. Um, I was at a conference once in those days when uh, a rather nervous, simultaneous interpreter who was, she was trying to translate the phrase Iron Curtain, and she said, the Iron Carpet mm -hmm. instead. And that always struck me as it struck me. It just came through my <laughs> earphones. No one else noticed it, probably. But it struck me as a as a more, in some ways, as a equally or more useful uh, image than Iron Curtain, because um, the Iron Curtain obviously obscured um, this part of Europe for people in the West, like me, people coming from the West, and we couldn't see what was going on here unless we took the trouble like I did in 83 and then permanently from 86 to come and find out what was going on here. But this lifting of an iron carpet, in a way, you'd see all the sort of dead grass or the dried out grass, but pretty good agricultural land underneath that, people waking up, people kind of stretching their legs, uh, plants, flowers, weeds, all kinds of life forms emerging, creatures, worms, um, emerging from underneath this iron carpet. And so there was this goodwill towards Hungary and the rest of Eastern Europe in the West. But I think here, to be fair, there was that goodwill was not um, complemented by a generosity from West European politicians. You know, there was a sense in the Western European elite, that um, the governing elite, the economic elite, that first of all, here was a, um, a place to make money, which obviously they came and made money, there was investment, but it was also a lack of generosity. There was no sense of the reunification of Europe. The Germans were very good at reunifying Germany, but I felt there was a missing will, a, a lack of political vision in Western Europe, in the Western world in the 1990s, they should have not waited until Hungary, Poland, the Czech and Slovak republics, Romania kind of joined them at a certain level. I think there could have been a reunification of Europe in the early 90s, parallel to the reunification of Germany. And I think it was a really missed opportunity. And people here in Hungary and elsewhere in Eastern Europe, they were expecting that. They were expecting to be welcomed back. And I think it hurt people here quite quite fairly. I think you were right to feel in Hungary and in Poland and the Czech and Slovak republics hurt that you weren't being welcomed back as you should have been. And that was a beginning of a misunderstanding or a resentment, which again lasts to this day. Um, I think too much was made by some of my journalistic colleagues that capitalism had won against communism, that the West had won against the East, that the Cold War, that there was a victor and a loser in the Cold War. I don't think there was a victor and a loser in the Cold War. This was not, life is about much more than economics. Obviously people like to have enough economic prosperity in order you know, not to worry about hunger and, and poverty and, and penury and, and misery, but at the same time, the revolutions of 1989, and I do think they were genuine revolutions in Hungary as well, they were about 
you know, a lifting of the human spirit, a demand for freedom, not just, of course, economic freedom as well, but um, social freedom, freedom to think, freedom not to be followed and so on. And so there was a missed opportunity then. Um, and uh, and we're still struggling with the consequences. It could have been done better. I know that you, you love tra traveling and exploring. And uh, as yourself and myself, we are a migrant as well. You had a great TED talk uh, uh, with the title, Why Do We Set Out? It was uh, represented by the TEDx uh, Budapest, uh, where you were highlighting that people were always in migration on the and on the move since the beginning of times. It's not a new thing. Uh, and uh, from 2015, you were intensively covering the migration and refugee situation in Europe, especially at the Hungarian border and also researched uh, several refugee stories and motives. Uh, the way the Orban cabinet handled the situation was also confusing and controversial, and at some points uh, violated international refugee laws uh, too. But to be fair, I admit that Austria and Germany and the EU itself were not uh, very well prepared for this either and handled the situation poorly. Uh, what do you think, uh, how come that the EU not prepared on the sudden wave of people? How come that we didn't have the right information in time on, on uh, what these countries need to prepare for? I mean, the warning signs were there in, you know, the collapse of the Arab Spring, um, the um, growing civil war in Syria, Uh, the emergence of the Islamic State driving people from their homes, the um, sheer misery and hunger and war and loss of life and the failure of the international community to support the people properly in where they fled to first, whether they fled to Turkey or Jordan or Lebanon already in 2012, 2013, and especially 2014, there were the refugee camps um, and the streets of the countries around Syria and Iraq were, were packed mm -hmm. with people. And um, if one looks at the sums of money, I think, paid in international aid to help people stay close to home so that they could go home if the war ever finished in their countries, um, were, uh, I think Hungary in one of those years paid $75,000 uh, to one of the UN um, uh, food program in one of those years, when the same year Sweden, for example, gave $76 million. These were um, just not enough was being done. But mm -hmm. inevitably, one of the great failings of politics is politicians seem to be elected for short periods of time, four years, and they're looking to the next day. They're looking to their popularity the next day. They're, there's a lack of, just as there was a lack in the 1990s of a vision to re-welcome Hungary and the rest of the Eastern Bloc back into Europe, I think there was a failure of vision among our political leaders in the mid-2010s to see the refugee crisis coming And, and also there was, of course, a knock-on effect. The war in Afghanistan, the collapse of, um, uh, it, of a safe environment in which to live forced many Afghans first to Pakistan, then to Iran, and then further on towards Europe. At the same time, the endless post-colonial crisis in Africa Uh, before I came to Hungary, I lived in Africa. I was a student in Dakar in Senegal. So, and on my travels in West and North Africa, before I came here, I'd seen people dying of starvation and dying of thirst on the edges of the Sahara Desert. So that gave me a, a pretty clear idea of the injustices as a young journalist in this world, and also of what real poverty is. For me, Hungary was never a particularly poor country. Um, it was in the richer part of the world. Certainly, there weren't many people starving here or people without shoes, except in, you know, in, in some of the very poorer 
ghetto type villages of the Roma. So um, to return to the sort of migration thing, um, as you mentioned, you're a migrant, I'm a migrant. I think we need to reclaim this migrant word. There's nothing good about being a migrant. You know, our mm. mothers at home miss us. Uh, we miss our families that in the countries we've left. But at the same time, there's nothing neither negative or positive about being a migrant. It's a natural state of the modern world. Goods travel, people travel. Um, and I think, um, you know, as a, uh, as a Christian, not particularly, but as someone coming from a Christian cultural background, I think it's important to show kindness to people in, in distress, people that mm -hmm. need help. And if a lot of people come at once, then people need to get organized and ask, who are you? Where are you coming from? How long do you want to stay? Um, what can we do to help? But obviously there are obligations as well on those people. If you're going to stay, then you need to respect the way things are done here. Uh, wearing you know, a headscarf is fine, but wearing a chador right across your face, I don't think is culturally acceptable in mm -hmm. Europe. You know, there's mm -hmm. uh, requests and obligations. And I think a lot of refugees and a lot of migrants, actually, it's not something, what, what was frightening for so many people in Europe at that time was partly the numbers, partly the speed of how many people were coming, but also that um, there was no time to think. I think there is a, a genuine culture of hospitality in Hungary, in all across Europe, in, in all countries and all cultures and religions of the world. But to be able to give that, that gift of hospitality, you need time to consider who you want to give that gift of hospitality to. And if too many people arrive all at once demanding hospitality, that was scary for a lot of Europeans and it was scary for a lot of Hungarians. And I'm afraid that I think, I think the Orban government's migrant policy has been a disaster. It's been anti-Christian, immoral, mm -hmm. And, and it's the exploitation of xenophobia um, in order to win votes. Um, and the Christian yeah. churches in Hungary were, it's been very shameful, I think, their failure to recognize that and to speak out uh, with some noble exceptions. So all these things, you know, one can get upset about. But at the end of the day, Europe did absorb the two million or so people that arrived mm -hmm. in the refugee crisis, just as Europe in 1920, 21, absorbed the two million people who fled to Bolshevik Russia, many of whom were Jewish, um, who were scary for Europeans at that time. People were, countries like France were, some politicians were afraid of the arrival of Jews who would um, uh, make their countries uh, increase the percentage of Jews in their country, just as today, some right-wing politicians in Europe are afraid of, that all these Muslims arriving will increase the number of Muslims in our countries. But I think people, I think migrants, whether it's you or me, when one moves to a different culture, a different country, we adapt to that country and we fit into that country or we leave if we don't fit in. Mm -hmm. And I think the countries we move to as migrants affect us and change us just like the weather changes us somehow. Yeah. Do you think uh, we can av avoid or should be uh, should avoid uh, this mass migration in the future? Like uh, what and what the world, like Europe or or the world in general, can do if we can do anything to avoid this. Uh, like millions of people moves uh, quickly from one region to another because of uh, war, hunger, climate uh, changes. Uh, what is our uh, what is our best chance to solve this problem? Because it's a huge. It could be a huge problem to Europe. I think it could be a huge problem to Europe um, but equally Europeans might need to flee Europeans you know if there is massive climate change if the sea levels rise 10 20 30 uh, meters then populations from low-lying lands in my own country Britain in mm -hmm. northern Europe in Germany and in Netherlands might find themselves having to flee to the higher ground of the Carpathians, for example, or the Alps or so on. Mm -hmm. So 
Um, firstly, we need to look after the planet and try to avoid climate change. But for that, we need a really drastic um, change in our way of life. We've seen with the COVID pandemic how people are capable of a drastic change in their way of life. But in fact, to, we've managed to revolutionize our countries in response to a nasty virus, but it's just one of the many viruses out there, really. We haven't been able to respond to a much bigger threat than COVID, which is climate change, in anything near the same way. Um, perhaps, you know, because the pandemic affects everyone equally, perhaps because Boris Johnson or Donald Trump or Viktor Orban are endangered by the virus, all our great white leaders. And um, whereas they feel they could protect themselves from climate change, but uh, um, you know, how to handle future waves of migration, it would be very important to find ways to govern Africa better. People don't want to leave home and travel to the far side of the world, risking their lives to do so, to live in an alien culture um, and try to adapt to that just in order for their children to be able to go to school or to be able to get clean water. People do like, even if they like to travel, they like to go home as well. Migration and also the experience of being a refugee isn't, isn't such a permanent thing. But if, it, if as an, someone from sub-Saharan Africa, you have to risk your life first crossing the Sahara Desert and then risk your life again at the hands of ruthless smugglers, then to cross the Mediterranean and risk your life again there, then to face the risk of uh, far-right thugs in Italy or vigilantes somewhere in Europe beating you up or violent police beating you up somewhere else. I mean, if you've somehow managed to survive that long journey, which might take years, you're never going to go back to Africa to see your old mother, your grandmother, to see your sister again, your younger brother. You're never going to go back to Africa if the journey is so difficult. And I think this is the strongest argument of the, for a liberal migration policy uh, which I think is more, much more sensible, that if it's easy to leave, then it should be easy to go back um, and take back some of your knowledge, some of your experience. We see Hungarians moving to Britain, um, working in the British National Health Service and bringing back experiences of how to have a more civilised health service in Britain there, bringing those experiences back to improve in the future the Hungarian health service. I don't see why... People from sub-Saharan Africa, from Afghanistan or Pakistan or Bangladesh can't do the same and then return to their own countries in due course. Maybe we should have more visa systems, more exchange, more legal migration. Um, I think that would undermine the desire or the phenomenon of irregular or illegal migration if only um, people were to recognize the economic benefits and um, the social benefits of having a free flowing, a free flowing world, you know. But there, there are downsides to that as well. What if people want to stay beyond the three years that you say you wanted them to? You know, when I fly, you know, I don't fly to Britain anymore because of the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, it's very difficult to get into my own country. But I remember over the years. Uh, flying back, landing in Luton Airport and looking down from the aeroplane, from the Wizz Air or EasyJet or whatever Ryanair flight. And my country is overpopulated. There's too many mm -hmm. houses and not enough fields. Britain is overcrowded compared to Hungary, say. Mm -hmm. And that's partly because of it was always, it, it became such an attractive place to live. Uh, a yeah. sense of uh, economic migration. So I'm not saying it's easy or that there's any simple answer, um, but I think it should be possible to have this conversation um, mm -hmm. without xenophobia, yeah. without whipping up sentiments against one another and, um, and to recognise at the end of the day that we're all human and that we have human rights to decency, to dignity. And if we can't find that at home, we're going to go looking for it and we have the right to go looking for that somewhere else. Mm, thank you.
Uh, you wrote a book, uh, uh, The Danube, A Journey Upriver from the Black Sea to the Black Forest. Mm. Uh, you highlight there that the, the Danube itself was a migration route from the ancient time. One time it was a part of the Silk Road, this uh, famous uh, trading route. And for example, a lot of uh, migrants from uh, Germany at that time in the 16th, uh, sorry, 18th century arrived to populate Hungary from Ulm, around Ulm, from around Ulm to settle down and working uh, in agriculture uh, in Hungary. So uh, what was your main lesson uh, to you after following the river and meeting the people beside the river? Is it uh, connects uh, the people and the cultures and is it really connects the Balkans to the best, to Western Europe? Absolutely, I mean, I was interested in in that book and in the television series I've made based on the book, the eight-part mm -hmm. series, which was shown in, in Hungary in the last year, um, I was interested in the Danube as a device to sort of point upriver. And that was why, both in the book and in the film series, that was the direction of travel, because I wanted to use it as a, as a device to s show how people arriving from the east see Western Europe. Mm -hmm. Just as the river flows in one direction, there's a kind of geographical um, flow of the river taking the waters of half of Europe eastwards into the Black Sea. But it's, the river is a kind of metaphor for that flow of people, whether mercenaries, traders, migrants, just explorers, travelers, people wanting to see a, another life, um, heading up into Europe. And so also the Danube's been there a very long time. The, the sturgeon, the fish, the tokhal in, or visa in Hungarian, mm -hmm. um, this became something of a, a sort of companion or a symbol for me on my own journeys upriver, because this is a, a fish that has um, been on swimming on the surface of the earth for 200 million years. Um, the fossils of the sturgeon, look the same as the current structure. It's a perfectly designed fish. And um, that its, its journey, its migration journey up the river has been blocked by the Iron Gates Dam. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, there's, there's various technological solutions being yeah. studied to, to help the fish over the dam, fish ladders, mm -hmm. fish lifts, and so on. So there's this vision shaped in my mind of the Danube really as being much more important than the nations are, uh, than the nationalities who live beside it. Obviously our local identity and our national identities and our regional identities are very important. Uh, I think there's a growing sense of a European identity. Hungarians never lose their sense of their astonishing language, their personal identity, the Serbs, the Romanians, um, the people of Dobroja around the Danube Delta, many of whom are themselves refugees from Russia, from the religious reforms under Peter I, under the Tsars, and many Ukrainians as well in the Danube Delta as well, many Turks left over and Tatars. Uh, so one has a sense as one travels up the Danube, one sort of shakes off this sense of Eastern Europe as being a place where one nation is constantly fighting or envious or cruel towards another nation or towards another people. And one has a sense of the sort of tolerance, which is also has always existed, of these intercultural or multicultural societies. Um, you know, the Austro-Hungarian Empire was a fantastic multicultural or intercultural entity. When the revolution broke out in 1989 in, in Temeswar, in Timisoara, that was thanks to the ability, the bravery of the Hungarians standing up to the Securitate past of Turkish, but also about the solidarity that the Romanians felt towards the Hungarians and the Saxons, the Germans in Transylvania. So there are plenty of, you know, I, I'm not 
it sounds like a romantic fairy story of the Danube linking the peoples of, of Europe, but I think there's enough truth in it to arouse my interest and feel that in a time when there's such a recurrence of nationalism and such a recurrence of xenophobia uh, and, and such a hostility towards migrants and migration, uh, such a sense of perhaps we need to build a fortress, turn our, our Europe into a fortress to keep outsiders out. For me to come along with a book and a television series, series to say, wait a minute, um, the wind blows radiation from Chernobyl over the whole world. Uh, there are traces of the radiation from uh, the Fukushima nuclear accident in Japan can be found also in the Danube Delta or in the sheep or in the um, meat that people in Europe eat, that rivers flow across national frontiers and have no, no regard for national frontiers, that these nations are actually a 19th century construct. Our languages are important, our cultures are important, but we actually have a great deal in common. And the Danube, for me was a device to, to illustrate that in what I hope is a humorous and, and um, open way to entertain those thoughts. And actually you know, meeting ordinary people who live on or beside the Danube, everyone you know, got interested in the fact I'd come on, so I was making such a long journey and um, they wanted to know, even if they, people don't normally travel up and down the Danube unless the cyclists are great champions of, of, of using the Danube in a similar way. But most people, you know, Serbs don't go, you know, if you, you don't go from Belgrade on holiday in Golubac, Golomboc mm -hmm. or uh, Kladovo, you go to the Adriatic, you go to Montenegro on holiday. Hungarians yeah. go to Balaton or they go to the Adriatic. They don't go to the Wachau in Austria or the D Danube Delta. Um, and it's fantastic. You know, it's like an ocean, for me, yeah, the Danube, yeah, yeah. after traveling it so much. And uh, I, I think um, all water has this kind of comforting or consoling role, a kind of vigostolo hotash mm -hmm. on people. And the Danube uh, um, is a great resource that we're not using it. My friend, the Hungarian writer, um, Karacson uh, Gabor, used to talk about, who was very active as, as an environmentalist as well, he used to talk about the, the Danube as a source of energy, but not of hydroelectric energy, but of this great river energizing all the countries and all the peoples it flows through. And uh, so that was that was the inspiration in a way for my book and for the television series. In this Hungarian documentary in 1988, what I mentioned in the beginning, there's a scene when you're having an interview with a young, ambitious politician, uh, Josef Sayer, about uh, the forming a, a new political party, Fidesz, and po possible political transitions in the region. And uh, the same person in 2020, having been called by the Belgian police on a private 25-man orgy above a gay bar in violation of uh, local coronavirus regulations. According to the statement from the Federal Prosecutor's Office, he has been fleeing via window and rain gutters downspout. His hands were bloody and ecstasy pill was found in the backpack. So, though uh, he denied uh, the drug was his, so I see it as a symbolic event which displays how the idea of turning our corrupt uh, communist country to a successful plural democracy failed uh, on a way and corrupted also uh, somewhere on the way. I assume you know this person quite well. You had an interview and probably you were following as a correspondent his, uh, his career. Uh, so for me, it's it's very tragical uh, and a, a very like a curtain fell down uh, kind of uh, moment was to me uh, on the Hungarian politics. What do you think about it? What was the reception in in, in abroad or in? Again, it, it's a complicated story. I mean, um, on a human level, I felt sorry for him actually, when it happened. Um, he's a very public figure, and to be caught with his trousers down 
in such a way, uh, in such an embarrassing situation. Um, you know, it, it, I, I felt sorry for him as a human being. You know, he's fooled from uh, a prominent, respected position to being a, becoming a ridiculous figure. Um, but I think at the same time that there's, I've always had a sense really since the 1990s, you know, since 1988 to some extent when um, I interviewed Yosef Sayer for that documentary and, and when at that time Fides, as he, and they used to say, they didn't even own a desk. They didn't have an office. They didn't have a desk. Um, they, you know, used to meet in this bar, uh, Monchery in Bartok Bela Street or in the, uh, the Serb Eterem, you know, near New Gotti Pai Udvar. And um, there's a sense, I think, of, of the way power corrupts. And you feel that very much in Fidesz, but one feels it in all countries. One feels it in you know, the British Conservative or the British Labour Party equally. One felt it in the administration of Budapest under a, the, the sort of liberal socialist administration of Budapest. Also, uh, the city was corrupted. The power, um, it's very hard not to get corrupted, I think, in power. But I think there is still a place for morality in politics and moderation in politics. And what I worry about with the current government is that the, the sense of moderation um, has gone. It's become a much more radicalized party um, in power. Uh, one of the Hungarian writers that I like a lot is uh, Sándor Maroy. And one of the books I was reading by him recently is um, his memoir of Hungary. It's, it's one of the few that's translated into English um, of his journals. And it's the one from 1944 to 1948. Um, and he speaks in that towards the end. So we, we're now, the, the journal starts in the last months of the Second World War with the uh, Red Army slowly occupying the Danube Bend, Budapest. And the section I'm reading at the moment of Mara is uh, he's walking through a newly liberated or conquered Budapest um, with where everyone is trying to pick up the pieces after the war. And he's contemplating the middle class, his middle class, his Hungarian intelligentsia, basically picking themselves up out of the ruins, trying to glue their furniture back together after the siege, trying to, on wandering the streets, trying to recognize one another in the ruins of Budapest. And he has this sentence about um, that there were only ever in the Hungarian middle class, liberal minded people and unliberal minded people. Um, and obviously he's identifying with the liberal minded people. But by that he talks about a, uh, a defensive conservatism in Hungary. And, and I think where the current rulers of this country have departed from, I think they've departed from a defensive conservatism to an, a more aggressive conservatism, if we can, can call it conservatism at all. So mm -hmm. there, I think Marai would be horrified by what's happening in Hungary today. But I think a lot of people, I think there are a lot of um, moderate, conservative-minded people who don't identify with the current rulers of the country, but equally the opposition have failed so far to be attractive to them. And I think the opposition will fail to defeat Fidesz until the day when they become attractive to um, defensive conservatives are uh, to uh, liberal conservatives. You know, in, you know, it doesn't seem, you know, even the phrase liberal conservative sounds strange in Hungarian, almost, mm. almost like a contradiction in terms. Whereas most conservatives around the world, I think, or in the developed world yeah. would call themselves liberal conservatives. And so this peculiar polarity, this peculiar opposition between liberal and conservative in Hungary, I think is one of the big problems, but it's a problem on the liberal side as well. I think there's a great intolerance of, um, of 
conservative thinking, sometimes among liberals in Hungary, of national thinking or of national identity. And I think mm. liberals, in, in a sense, you know, who well, it's easy to blame Viktor Orban, but Viktor Orban is, is a product of the last 35 years in Hungary, you know, and you do get the you do get the government you deserve. And so he's a reflection of the country. He's not the kind of some kind of evil force at the head of it. And if he were to uh, be voted out of office, everything would be fine. I think, you know, and coming, this brings us right back to the um, 1989 and, and what was happening then and the years when I was first here. I think there has been, and, and one of your, one of the things we've discussed about the Secret Service files, for example, should they be opened? I think as important, of course they should, but as important would be a real, um, for people to study and understand what those 30 odd years of communism were really about, how much of that has been swept under the carpet. And there hasn't really been a, a proper discussion here about what Kadarism was all about. And many, you know, proud anti-communists today um, yesterday or the day before yesterday, they were using their contacts to get their kids into university. There was a kind of corruption, uh, an erosion of the Hungarian spirit in the communist years, which most people took part in because to make their lives easier. Um, and the you know, the gratitude money, the hala pains in the healthcare system. I think it wasn't just in the healthcare system. It worked through the universities. It worked through all aspects of life here. And to that extent, of course, Istvan Churk was right. There was no revolution and a cleaner or bigger revolution might have helped clear the air. Um, but of course, one of the great skills of the Hungarians was to avoid any kind of bloodletting, any kind of violence. And one has to admire the people's intelligence for doing that. But one could still have good discussions about the compromises that were made in those years and the compromises that have been made since. I think, you know, there was an image in one of the papers this morning in India of someone from, I think, Modi's party burning an effigy of Greta Thunberg, the environmental activist. I mean, to burn the image of a 16-year-old, heroic, clean, idealistic person who is really trying to wake the world up to the disasters of um, destroying this planet. It's symbolic for me of the aggression, the lack of will for discussion, the lack of dialogue, which in a democratic world is so necessary because I think I do have a great faith in humanity, in people's common sense, in people's intelligence. But for that, you need information and you need discussion and you need debate and you need to some, somehow a lot of patience and toleration to understand the other side. And um, I don't see enough of that in Hungary today. It would One would really need to foster um, as you're doing, I hope, with this program, um, that, that, you know, a cultural discussion. We don't need to hate each other. No one, ha hatred will, will take us nowhere. To wrap up this interview, I wanted to ask you to recommend um, or mention some of books, films or music, what was inspiring uh, or inspired you recently. Uh, which you would recommend to our viewers in, in any matters? One book I would strongly recommend is um, a novel, a science fiction novel by Kim Stanley Robinson, an American writer uh, called uh, New York 2140. This is a book about um, a post-environmental disaster world in which the ice caps have melted and the sea level in two surges. I think the first surge in his book was in 2080 and the second surge was in 2120. And here we are in Manhattan in 2140 when much of New York is underwater, when there are bridges between this, what's left of the skyscrapers. And people are trying to make a living. It's, it's got um, amazing characters, um, you know, kids, 
kind of desk ash kids, skateboard kids making a living there. There's all kinds of shenanigans of, of corruption, big bankers, people betting, gambling on the, a sort of stock exchange of which building's going to collapse next around the world, futures on the coastal, on the collapsing coasts of the world. And it's a kind of, on one level, it's an um, environmental nightmare book, but on another level, the human stories in it and also the attempts of, it, it's, a, it's a way of using fiction to explore the what the world might like if climate change continues. And um, so it's, but it's more powerful in that sense than any newspaper article. That's one book I would mention. So Kim Stanley Robinson, uh, New York 2140. Um, film wise, um, I've just seen um, Born in Auschwitz, uh, a very powerful film uh, by my friends, uh, uh, Andras Tokac and Cheke Ester. Uh, it, it's been five years in the making and because I know them well, I collaborated closely with them for my own Danube series. I know how much they've been working on that. And it's, I just watched it uh, mm -hmm. last night, in fact. So it's very much in my mind. And it's, mm -hmm. it's obviously it's a very powerful theme. I think many non-Jewish Hungarians kind of perhaps are resentful about that the Holocaust story or the many stories of the Holocaust are so well told in Hungary. And I think many Hungarians may react to it in that sense. Oh, oh no, not another son of Saul, not another Holocaust story, because no one's denying the Holocaust, but why is it always about the Holocaust and not about Trianon, not about all the other disasters in Hungarian history. But I think as an example of powerful storytelling, um, creative storytelling, Born in Auschwitz is an amazing film. Um, but equally, I think there is obviously space for the telling of Hungarian history, whether it's Trianon, whether it's the heroic battles or heroic events of Hungarian history. And no one's saying that these should not be told. I can sympathize with that frustration sometimes um, on the right in Hungary that, um, Hungarians are not very good at telling their own story, uh, but there are such good modern writers, such good novelists, such good filmmakers working today. I, w I also saw um, Mundruzzo's film, Pieces of a Woman, uh, which is also a very powerful film uh, set. He had to move it to the United States, the setting of it, because if you'd set that film, I read an interview with Mundruzzo about it in Hungary, it would have it wouldn't have been seen in its kind of, in its broad aspects of humanity, of the huge issues of humanity that it's dealing with. Um, it's an issue very close to my heart because all my children were born at home in Hungary. And obviously the story of Agnes Gerib, the independent midwife, was one of the stories which Mundruzzo followed or developed. Uh, it's one of the inspirations, not the only one by any means to make that that film. So it's a, that's also a very good, very thoughtful film. Those are some of the um, books or um, films that have been inspiring me or provoking me to think or rethink myself. Because I think as a journalist here, as a writer here, um, one has to challenge oneself all the time. In order not to take one side or another in politics, I have to spend a lot of time with people from the governing side as well as the opposition side, trying to understand the way they think. But of course, this country has always been much bigger than its politics. Um, you know, I go out onto the streets, I'm rather shy. I don't actually find it easy to do vox pops, you know, to interview people on the street. Mm -hmm. uh, to just to walk up to people who say, excuse me, I'm from the BBC. But whenever I do, I'm struck by the astonishing ambiguities, the astonishing stories that people are willing to tell me. And I am reminded of that huge privilege I have as a reporter, that while other people are stuck in their boring offices or their boring uh, factories or workspaces um, or struggling to make a living, that I have this peculiar privilege to 
walk up to anyone on the streets, ring up anybody from Victor Orban down to the poorest Roma person in the corner of Sotmar or Borshod and, and ask them what they think. And they have a right. Unfortunately, Victor Orban doesn't seem to want to speak to me anymore, but the poorest Roma do. And often I think they perhaps their story is more interesting anyway. Thank you. Nick Thorpe, thank you very much. I'm really appreciated for your time and answers. I would like to ask everyone to subscribe to the channel. Uh, we continue upload uh, content to this English playlist as well. And take a look on the description uh, for the links related to the presentations and videos being mentioned during the conversation. Please support our work by signing up or to our Patreon page where we're sharing exclusive content to the patrons. Thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you and goodbye, everyone. Mm -hmm.